All right, so let's now build a histogram. In this entire example, I'll be building, building the histogram from data one on the data sheets or the data table. So sometime you are handed with a data set that's uh, quite unorganized, a, a, a numerical data set that uh, being quite un unorganized like data one that you found on your data sheet or data table. So before we can get started with a histogram, then it's always a good or a better idea that we can put the data in order. And so in your data sheet, I have already put a sorted version of your data one. Okay, so we will be starting to build a histogram for data one, and that's our main focus. And so the idea of getting a histogram is that before we can get any histogram, we must, after putting the data into sorted the data, sorted data, we must also um, build a table that I call the class frequency distribution table. So this table is called the class frequency distribution table. Okay, and so putting the table in column view or row view is pretty, pretty much uh, your choice. But the idea now is that uh, on my left hand side of the table of this table here on my left column, I am going to put the data into classes. And on the right hand side here, I'm going to, the column here, I'm going to label the frequencies. And so, let's say easiest way to get started with any table and, and I got to clarify one thing that the way I'm showing you here is not the only way of how we build a histogram. There are quite many different methods out there how to build a histogram. However, the method I'm about to show here is just happened to be the most universal one. And so I'm going to start out my first class of this data. You can notice that the, the smallest data in our value is 60. So once again, 60 is the smallest data value in our data one. So, so looking for the smallest data, I'm going to create a class that runs from 60 to 70. And right now, you, do, you don't need to worry too much about uh, how I came up with that 70. And I will explain that shortly, later on. And then now, that's now we have a class. And then the next class now is going to be a class that have values that runs anywhere from 70 to 80. And then we are going to have another class that runs from 80 to 90. And now, as you can see where we're going, then the next class would be 90 to 100. Now I'm going to continue getting up more classes. 100 to 110. I'll have another class from 110 to 120. And then I'm going to get into my last class here, being 120 to 130. And then in bigger, in larger data containing more values, we can even keep, we can keep having more classes, more and more classes. And so before we go further, let's have a couple of clarifications about the idea right here. So first of all, Let's have a look at one class. Let's say, let's have a look at that class right here. The class I'm looking at right now that I'm looking at and focus to is the class from 80 to 90. 
let's understand a couple terminologies and definitions. No, and I have to clarify that 80 with a dash and 90 right here, this does not mean a subtraction. It just means we have a class here taking values running from 80 to 90. So, so that's your class. The lower number right here is called the lower limit of a class. And a lot of time throughout my lecture, I'm going to use a shorthand notation as an LL. And I'm not alone in this. Many other instructors also using LL as, as a shorthand writing for lower limits of a class. The upper number, the higher number, here in a class, is called, and as I just said it, upper limits. And we can have a shorthand writing UL to indicate upper limits. And so now you're starting to worry a little bit that these 90s and then 100 and 70s are not be necessarily values, they are not being found anywhere in your data one. No worry. The point is, these are only class limits. It limits who's going to be qualifying, which member is qualifying to get into a class. But these are not meant to be data values. So you do, you do not need to worry about uh, whether these uh, limits, numbers, being in the data or not. And now, the idea now is that Let's learn a method so that we can put members into a class. The idea now is that we're going to put all data values into each class right here. So the most universal way to decide, let's say x is a data value, then we're going to rely on this rule over here to decide uh, which member belongs to which class. Let's say anytime a member, a data value, falls, falls into a class, then the value, the, data, the member value has to be greater than or equals the lower limits and has to be strictly less than the upper limits. Okay, and so now quickly, for example, the class that runs from 60 to 70. We can take any member going into this class must satisfy the member value is greater than or equal to 60 and has to be anywhere strictly less than 70. Okay, and so taking this rule over here, now we are ready to find all members and count how many members going into the first class. And so please look back into your data one. And so in data one, if we counting through the data with the, with the rule I just introduced, then we found we found 12 members going into this class that takes values running from anywhere from 60 to less than 70. Now the next class over, if you're looking through, counting through, then we're going to start including all the 72s, all the 76, and then oops. So in this way, where should the 80s go? 80 is not going to go into this class. 80 is not going into this class from 70 to 80. The rule set clearly. We want member value to be below the upper limit. And so 80 is going to wait for the, the next class down below. And so in this way, from 70, taking members with values from running from 70 to 80, we're looking at 14 members in that class 
taking value from 70 to anywhere less than 80. And then so on and so on. The next class down, so you can see that obviously 80 belong to this third class right here. And let's look for the members. And so now to clarify, the number of members in each class is what we call formally the frequency in a class, the frequency of a class. And so in the next class, I'm looking at eleven members and now we formally say that, that class from 80 to 90 has frequency 11 and so the next class down I'm looking at we can quickly count and find out that we have one member we also have one member in this class from 100 to 110 and we have zero member it is entirely okay to have zero member. So make a note on that. It's entirely okay to have zero member. And then the last class is once again back to having one member or frequency one. So another question to to raise now at this point as we're building up a and so far this is not a histogram yet this is just a sort of like a preparation before and, and anyone who are about to build a histogram must take this preparation step right here and this table in particular we refer to that once again as the class frequency table and so the question now arised here is that when can we stop? Meaning, when, when, can, when can we stop making more classes? The idea is now, technically speaking, in theory, I can keep putting up more classes. Like, say, in a way how, how I'm going right now, we're going to be having, we can have another 130 to 140 and 140 to 150. But then, if we think about it, if we are putting all these classes up, we're never going to end, and these are all going to have zero members throughout all of them. And so a good question here is that when can we stop? So what you can see now is that the answer, the best answer to this is we stop, we stop when every value belongs to a class and so you can see that if you're looking back into our data one right here and that was that's why it was smarter to look at the the sorted data and more convenient to look at, at the, the sorted data because the highest member value was 124 and it was in this class right here and so once you came to that class which already had your highest data member then that means we we already ensure that every member already belong to a class so there's no there's no more need to build these further class down and so our frequency distribution class frequency distribution table can stop here and that's the you can any time that you build a histogram, you can always rely on these uh, a couple of these uh, guidelines like that. And of course, we keep getting closer and closer to how we can transform all this into an actual histogram. Keep in mind, right now we're still not into a histogram yet, and I I really need to show you you know all the details and necessarily for you to move on and and be able to put that into a hist histogram. And so, once again, let's look at a class. Let's say that class, again, that I'm still having a red marker pointing down to it. But a class here, so now, this class from 80 to 90. Now, if you really take the up limits, 90, and subtract 80. Now, I really mean a subtraction. So, this subtraction here gives you a value being 10. And so now this 10 right here 
we actually call that this 10 right here we actually call that a the class width so generally and it makes sense easily that any class width simply equals the up limit minus the lower limit and also to clarify statistics in these days are quite uh, universal and it's such a, a large and a, a diverse study field out there so as you serve the web sometimes the same term class width right here but some textbooks might be referring to this as a uh, bin size or in simply because the, the, the textbook author was treating treating each class here as a bin instead of calling that a class and so here we a class width is referred to as a bin size and and there are many other ways of how we can refer to a class width but so another thing now as I pointed out that we have a, the class from from 90 from 80 to 90 has class with 10 and now we can quickly look through look through back into this histogram and look through every single class right here you can notice that we actually in this in this histogram we actually using equal class width there are a lot for us to notice about uh, the so we are using all equal class width right here now is this a must is this a must that we are using equal class width no but it's better Okay, it's not a must, but it's better to use equal class width. So as I was saying, no, it's not a must to have equal class width. That means I, I do leave room for there are other times out there. It's probably not going to happen throughout our quarter here, but there are application out there where people do need to build histogram with unequal class widths but uh, I doubt that uh, that cases or situation have to happen anywhere near our discussion lecture here so in this particular example I'm only gonna focus to um, equal class width and and uh, and later on throughout the quarter if at any time if, if there's a special need I will point out when it we need to have a, a an un, in some some unequal class widths here and now let's continue on and at this point there's still another thing that uh, a couple other details that I, I hope it start triggering up your curiosity however I decide not to mention it here yet let's get to the exciting point of uh, building the histogram the actual histogram here and so now you already had the class frequency successfully built on the left hand side here it lists all the classes with equal width and here on the right hand side we have we have filled out with all the the class member the number of members going into each class and so all together these are what I so call any of these we refer to them as the class frequency all right so now as we are about to build the histogram I'm gonna In the end, after a lot of explanation, a histogram is a graph. It's just like a graph, like in the same sense of a graph in any other courses you have done, in any, any other math courses you have done. So we don't need to wait until the statistics to understand what a graph is. And so the idea of the graph here is we always going to have a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. And so now specifically, I, I am going to put the class, the classes on the horizontal axis. 
I am going to pick a, a starting point. And this starting point here, I'm going to label that 60. So now here's the important thing. Now, the next spot over, I'm going to pick another one. How far the space between the two spots right here is pretty much for now. It's, it's my choice. It's your choice when you're doing one on your own. And I call that spot right here 70. But once you have picked for yourself a, a space right here between the two spots, then the following points that you put down have to, well, try your best to maintain the exact same equal space. Because these are, this is the 80, this is 90 right here. So e the space inside each of these is going to be a class to represent it on the graph, on the histogram. And then so the next space over is 100. And of course, like I said, our, we are we're looking for our best to draw to aim at equal space, but of course I'm not expecting anyone to compete with computers and make uh, exactly precise uh, spacing right here. Okay, and so it looks like I did I did make it a little too hard for myself by making the space a little too small, but it's okay. We we learned the idea. And so now the idea now is that at at, at a, a look ahead right here, but histogram is each class is gonna be depending on how high the frequency is. Each class here is gonna rise and and consequently it will become the bars and so now I'm gonna we're gonna start getting into it now think about this this way right here but and of course in, in these days we have uh, computer softwares we have a lot of nice and advanced powerful computer programs so I don't expect too many times that you have to draw these things by hands but of course you know we, we need to get a certain decent level of, of these skills right here so in the worst case that we have to build one completely from scratch and and have to draw one manually like this then uh, here's the best way now it's just my own personal experience but uh, if you're looking through the entire frequency distribution table one more time here the highest frequency class frequency is 14 if you notice that so this is what I'm doing I am going to choose a the maximum scale on my vertical scale right here and by the way of course the vertical scale is to represent my frequency so the highest frequency I'm gonna go here is 60 so wait a minute we, we, you, didn't I just say 14 was the highest frequency I understand but that was the highest frequency among the classes here just to set my scale I'm gonna start out with 16 why 16 it just I don't know. It's just the human being. It's just for us right here. It's always easy to cut a distance into half. And so here I have halfway is 8. And then it's still easy to cut these into halves again. So those further halves, they are the quarters. And so now we have 4 and 12 there. And of course, it's still easy to cut those other quarters into the further halves. And now these are obviously, these are the 2, 6, 10, 6, 10, 12, and the 14. And now that maximum frequency member will hit that spot right there. And that was our scale. And so now, everybody now is ready for getting your own histogram right here. So the first class, the frequency distribution table is at 12. So now I'm going to draw, I'm going to rise uh, as a column to hit 12. And that gives a perfect spot point here to stop. And so now, and then for us for right here, a lot of time when you are, excuse me for my phone ring, but a lot of time when you, doing all this it's always a good idea idea that we can put the numerical label on top of each histogram bar and so that was my first class the height and the frequency here is consistent with, with, with whatever came out from your class frequency distribution table and so the next thing the next class here from this class from 70 to 80 it's gonna be as high as 14 so now we have that we can just continue drawing that line a little bit up Okay, and there I have, and of course we are all human beings, so I cannot ex I cannot expect myself to be exactly precise. I cannot expect any one of you to be exactly perfect, but we we represent the idea, and so put the numerical label of how high that column is. 
and it's having 14 members in it and then the next class over is going to be 11 so now you see if we were making these uh, the way how we were making these partitions by cutting things in half now at least it's easy to see where 11 is so now I have 11 is about right there and so now I have uh, 11 and that's why it's always best to actually label the, the numerical put the numerical label of how high the column is and then in next one here we have our class from 90 to 100 is yes, let's say 1 which is exactly halfway between 0 down here and 2 so I have another one that's going right there okay, a very short little guy right there but that's one class of the histogram and the next one over is an, another class, another column being the same height, one. And there was a, a class that having zero members. So I'm doing nothing but just maybe making it a little heavier weight right here, indicating it's right on the x-axis. And this is zero member. And now the next class over is back into being one. And this is how we build our first histogram. Now keep in mind a couple good practice. This is a good practice. Sorry for my uh, nasty handwriting but here but a good practice would be a lot of time when you are making your own histograms right here then you will be it's always a good idea nobody force you to do this but it's always a good idea that you can shade in your columns right here the idea now is that you, you definitely want your histogram to stand out. Your graphical display stands out so that readers can understand it much better and see all the ups and downs and all that. But there you go, here's your first histogram. Now, at this point, we didn't get too far into the quarter yet, but uh, here's I call it an optional enhancement. But uh, from the tip of each bar here, why don't we just simply connect the tip of all the bars here and, and of course don't worry that the lines are quite broken but as you connect through right here it starts forming into some kind of shape the red just the red line itself right here okay and for now don't don't worry about the name whatever that's called for now I just refer to that as an optional enhancement and then you will understand how it becomes later in, in the quarter all right so now you made your huff your first histogram so a first, a, a few things to understand before we close down the example. All right. So you can see that uh, in a, in this histogram of mine right here. First of all, if you're looking at the columns, the the width of the column or the the the, the formal name for that, the class width here. Represent by the width of the column is representing by the represented by the, the width of the columns and so It makes sense and it makes perfect sense that we shouldn't have gaps, right? So in other words, no gaps, no space between the bars No gaps or space okay. Between the bars between the columns But wait a minute, didn't we have a space between these two? Now, the space, a space between any two histogram columns or any two histogram bars right here does mean a zero member class, but it doesn't really mean space. So, I'm going to make a quick scratch one right here, but sometimes I see people making real creative histogram. You got a couple columns here and a column there, and they call that 60 to 70 and a 60 to, and a 70 to 80 but there's a little space between the two 70s think about what makes sense right here can the same numerical value stays into the same uh, stay into two different spots right there so strictly remember when you're creating your histograms we cannot have leave gaps now and and here i'm talking about when you're building your own uh, hand sketch of a histogram right here and it makes perfect sense with the way, remember, we here we're specifically discussing about, uh, we're learning about numerical data. So a class is an interval of values, right? So if you have done some, some uh, the course in algebra, you, you must have heard of the term an interval of values. So a class here in our statistical term, it does mean it's a 
an, an, an interval of numerical values. So it makes no sense that we have uh, a little space here and then there's the same 70 but uh, a space there. People will immediately attack at your pr presentation showing a histogram like this and questioning you what's, the, what's that space meaning representing? The, the, what is the space that being contained between the two 70s? So be careful with those uh, kind of uh, over creative mistakes. Okay. All right. And then there are still a few more uh, things that I need to show everybody. So I don't want to erase out my histogram yet now because we will be back to that. But there are quite a few uh, details that I want you to understand. And throughout our discussion, hopefully some of you already noticed. Back to the class width. Okay, so for this histogram, I chose a class width being 10. And you can see that entirely throughout the, the example so far, there has never been any explanation of why 10. Why choosing 10? It's just simply a choice I made. Like that. So here's the thing. I'm going to start pointing out a couple of what ifs right here for everybody. So now, sadly, I have to really erase because I need more space to draw my histogram. But so I chose the class would be in 10 for right here. Let's say I'm going to point out a couple of what ifs. What if we chose the class width? right from the beginning and like I said again you when you build your own histogram you have your choice to make to decide how big the class width is and so here's a couple things that you might want to be aware about but what if you chose a class width to be for this data one chose a class width being 100 okay it's not illegal nothing really wrong but here's what consequently your histogram is going to become and look like. As far as the class frequency distribution table, here's what it happens. Just like the same old rule we've had. As far as classes, I'm going to look for the smallest data in the, in the entire data set. And so that's 60. And so now getting to my, com getting to my complete class, 60 here, I'm going to have my first class running from 100 running from 60 to all the way to 160. Okay, and now at this point, it's gonna, now our, our entire data here has a, a total, a total number of values. Is we got all together 40 pieces. So that is also going to be our total count of all the members. And so all of a sudden, this one big giant class right here dumped all members of the data into one same class. And this is the frequency. And like I said again, nothing illegal about this. And let's look for a further consequence that this will bring. And so getting into an translating this into a histogram, and you already learned throughout the, 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 the previous experience, this is also our last class because all members already belong to that only class. And so now when you are putting this into a histogram, and I can just close my eye and do this, but really all you do is just pick a spot you call what, 60, pick another spot you call 160, how far between them, that's your choice. And this, the scaling here, you can just call it 40, and your histogram has become something like this. One bar only, one column only, ever. Okay. 40 members. So, like I said again, legally speaking, it's not wrong. Legally, however, think about the employer because the whole purpose of doing statistics is one day you're going to be employed, one day you're going to be working for a company, you're going to be working for, some, working for somebody, and you're going to be presenting your data. 
think about your employer who are reading your report and they seeing a histogram like this. What are what is your employer going to be thinking? It's going to show that you are a lazy worker. You don't want to spend too much time and effort. Of course, this brings you some good things that you don't have to spend too much effort. However, the consequence for that is uh, it's showing that you are not a, a a, a good worker, you don't want to spend too much time and effort and, and that might be risky for your job to be serious. So stay away from that extreme right there even though it's not wrong. Let me point out another what if. What if right from beginning we chose or you can choose a class would be in five. So you can see that it's a it's a about half the size of our class what we've had earlier in our actual example. And so and so here the class frequency distribution table is gonna look like this. Okay, as far as the classes. I'm going to have one class from 60, once again, same rule, and then this is the third time I'm repeating it, so hopefully you start getting that general rule right there. It's not the only rule, but it, it works a lot of time right here, but I'm going to go from the six, the, the smallest data value in the, in the entire data set, and then from there, my class would be in five. My up limits now is going to be 65, so I have a first class going running from 60 to 60, 65. The next class down, I'm going to have from 65 to 70 and the next class down I'm going to have from 70 to 75 and the next class down I'm going to be going from 75 to 80 now you start sensing what's going on here simply just putting up the classes we already have to spend way too much effort and I'm starting to feel like I want to give up already all right and so from 60 to 65, uh, there are only, if you're looking back into your data, there are only three, okay? And then, the, actually, no, I'm counting wrong. From 60 to 65, we got, we've got seven members here. And then from 65 to 70, we have five members there, okay? and then so on and so on and you can see that this is way too much work and this is uh, I, I doubt if I can even finish this thing in, in, in a short amount of time right here so what's the pros and cons of something like this choosing a small class with, class with like this it's not wrong again legally speaking it's not wrong however and and it will show it will definitely show a lot of up and downs so pros it has good details, really good details. But cons right here, it's simply too much work. Okay. In, in these days where computers are quite powerful, you probably don't feel too much about, you know, the, you, don't, you probably don't have too much uh, the feeling about how much too much work costs you, but uh, back in the days where you know everybody who are who are, who were analyzing data were have, were were building these things with with papers and pencils, then you know having a small class with data, the, having a small class with histogram would cause a lot of trouble for them, and so too much work to the point that uh, think about it is the pay even worth it for you know for yourself spending that, that much effort onto it into it. Okay, so I can't really, I cannot, I can never really say, you know, what could be a good one, what could be a good, uh, what could be a good class width. But uh, I pointed out the two extreme right there, just like, just too many, many bars, right? That's one extreme, and then the other extreme is only one bar. Okay stay somewhere between stay here between the two extremes right there from the extremely too much work to the extremely too much uh, the extremely lazy case right there. 